So the uh, experiments at the time were up to C15, and we needed something in the situation. And so I took a trip to Exxon. They were the ex experts on clusters of carbon, and because they oil business and so on, they were into that. And they were the people that had gone up to C15. And I encouraged them to go beyond C15 and to try to get find out why we had we were vaporizing such large clusters and what the that was about. And so they did this experiment. This is the work in 1984. And they found a big spike of 60 atoms of carbon coming off in the cluster. Separately was pretty good. I think we walked up to 13 markers and stuff. But you could see that their spectrum showed that there were really large chunks coming off and what was this about. And this, of course, led to the work of Furlo, Smallwood, and Furl, who made a model without ever seeing that it was C60, that there would be an icosahedron. So this is very, very bold work. Um, after they did this work, we actually measured the infrared and Roman spectrum verify that this was uh, uh, correct. And a uh, book on this whole topic, this is when I started writing books in carbon and coming through and going to on bullies. Uh, we, we were told that the conference is about teaching students, so I thought I'd mention my activities in teaching students. This is a, an encouragement from the Bell Labs because they didn't have students there, and they, they felt that the academic community should help out by making writing textbooks. Help everybody. So that was they started this approach. So um, with low laser power to uh, uh, make these clusters, the spectrum, the uh, infrared spectrum was kind of simple, and the Raman spectrum was not so complex either. And each one of these peaks that we observed could be explained in detail. Then we use higher layer laser power, and you can see that there are many, many lines. In fact, there were 200 or so infrared aquifers and 200 Raman aquifers. You can see what happened. And the reason for that is that you have a molecule that's so extremely symmetrical that you have so many allowed transitions, and they can make combination modes and harmonics. So we have these 200 modes in the red and while I'm active. And in the book, we actually identify all of these modes. It was really the most amazing thing to do solid state physics and molecular spectroscopy at the same time. And I think carbon was the first system where this was possible. And I think there's still problems in this area available this whole thing was not yet closed. But people moved on. So th this was um, now full of these. And uh, I was saying that in the 1980s, we started moving in other areas. And uh, uh, the second interpolation compound conference, I met uh, uh, Endo Sensei. And uh, what he taught me was that they he could make these carbon fibers, and these carbon fibers were a, a new material, new carbon material, that was very long and thin, so you could do transport measurements uh, with accuracy that we didn't have before. So we studied with him in the early 1980s the interpolation of his fibers. These had carbon fibers, and at the center of the carbon fiber was magnitude, turned out. And we used to see these uh, little things coming out of the AM, and we didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. But this turned out to be a forerunner of something important in the carbon science. But in the late 1980s, this is before the AMs <coughs> came and wrote a book on carbon virus, and this is another book that it wasn't only full of things, but we also did on carbon fiber. And this book uh, had a different audience. This is an audience of, of people doing applications. 
And we heard that uh, the Brazilians are interested in applications. And um, I wrote this for our students because they were getting all kinds of results. And the literature was so confusing. Um, when a scientist moves into ap the applications world, and we, you get into a kind of literature that's much, much more difficult to read and understand. Because it doesn't have a lot of science, but it has many results that are unexplained. So uh, it's a challenge for the scientists to try to explain these and develop some kind of uh, applications. So I, I show this slide with this message because I think this is a future uh, challenge and uh, something that the Brazilians might uh, uh, pay attention to now that they're uh, really at the forefront of, 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 of their fields. So anyway, we were doing these uh, uh, carbon fibers, and, um, and um, they became thinner and thinner, and um, they were down well below the one um, micron. They started out from 10 to 100 microns, and then they, toward the end, they got down to one micron. And um, so we, there was a conference in Washington. This is an important conference because I was invited to give a talk on this topic, so you hear the carbon fibers. And Smalley was invited to give another, another talk in the same conference, in the same session, uh, on C60. And uh, after these talks were over, it was in the afternoon, toward the end of the wrap up, what did we learn at this conference? They brought the two of us into the stage, and they asked us, what is the what is the connection between the talks on Z60 and the talks on fiber? So impromptu came up with this. C60 goes to C70. That we know we were ready. These were the two stable forms. We didn't really have an idea about C80, but why not? You make them elongate the C60 to make C70. Along this axis, you can make C80. Maybe you can keep elongating it and have just a single two. So we propose this as an interesting topic. And uh, what was kind of amazing about this is at the end of a conference, people are usually ready to go home. But when we started talking about this, uh, very smartly and myself, everybody was going to take their notebooks out and taking some notes about what we were talking about. So somebody was interested in this. So maybe we should be interested too. So that was my take on message. And um, so this is what happened. I know I'm following up. This is the beginning of nanotubes for us. So in uh, this was 1990 uh, when this conference took place. And in the uh, fall of that year, at the end of the year, we had two visitors of MIT. I think you heard that in the introduction. One of them was Saito, Michiro Saito, and the other one was Fujita. <laughs> and uh, so Saito came to visit me, and Fujita came to visit another professor. But they both got interested in this topic somehow. And they, um, well, we asked ourselves, if you could make a, a, single, uh, a single layer of carbon atoms and wrap it into a tube, what would the special properties be? Could this be an interesting thing to do? At that time, we didn't know if anybody could do this. But suppose that you could do it. Would this be something we should put effort into and try to make it? So that was the idea of the uh, uh, calculation. 